What are the threats that climate change imposes on living species? How can an increase of just a few temperature degrees be a menace for biodiversity? Those questions are important to ask, but not easy to answer. One thing for sure is that climate change is more than just an increase of average temperature on the globe. We also expect and observe changes in precipitation and in the frequency of extreme events, extreme droughts, floods, or large forest fires. Disturbances from climate change as this manifold and come on top of other disturbances caused by human activities. How are wild species going to respond to those disturbances? I will focus my talk on this question, trying to understand species' responses to climate change. I am an evolutionary biologist. I will thus use the theory of evolution as the main conceptual framework to understand the ecological and evolutionary responses of organisms facing, facing the threats of climate change. But let me introduce the subject with a short movie. Organisms usually live in well-defined climatic areas. My example is set in an alpine ecosystem, the area above the tree line. Alpine ecosystems are similar to boreal ecosystems. They are similarly sensitive to climate change and are expected to be exposed to fast paces of future climate warming. If we consider plant species living on this mountain, for instance, the alpine carnation, we can describe its ecological niche as the set of climatic and physicochemical conditions in which the species can grow and persist. These are the abiotic conditions of the, of the ecological niche. Interactions with other species will also affect the growth and persistence of a species. For instance, through negative interactions with competitors or with grazers and predators, or through positive interactions with pollinators, which are necessary for the reproduction and thus the persistence of the species. We can represent the abiotic ecological niche on the map, marking the geographical areas that are suitable for the growth of the species. These are the areas on the mountain that have the right set of climatic condition and, the, and thus fall within the ecological niche of the species. When those conditions change due to climate warming, we must update the map, marking new areas as suitable if they now fall within the niche or as unsuitable, in red here, for instance, if they now fall outside the ecological niche of the species. Now, let's look at the growth cycle of our plant species. As every species, it goes through mating, reproduction, and death, over and over again, year after year. When the species is living in favorable conditions, the population will grow until it reaches what we call the carrying capacity of its environment, which depends on the quantity of resources available to grow. However, when the conditions change and become less favorable, the population may not survive anymore. The species then has two options to survive. It can follow its ecological niche by dispersing its seeds, as here, when the seed attach to the fur of a chamois and move up the mountain to finally land in an area now favorable for growth. The other option is to adapt to the new conditions. It will happen if some individuals can survive and reproduce because they were genetically different from the rest of the population. Their offspring then will be able to start a new population with a new genetic composition. There would have been adaptation by natural selection then in this population, 
Which of these two options will succeed depends on the characteristics of the species and of the environment. To follow its niche in space, the species has to have good dispersal abilities. And that can be challenging for plants because seeds often cannot move fast or far enough. To adapt to new local condi climatic conditions, the species must have enough genetic variation on which natural selection can operate and must be able to maintain a population when condition deteriorates. And this depends on the survival and mortality rate of the species. Using computer modeling to simulate the ecological and evolutionary responses of alpine plants to climate change, we found that, unfortunately, many species will suffer from a too fast pace of increase in temperature and be at high risks of extinction. There are two main components to this negative outcome. First, because of the shape of mountains, the upslope movement of the ecological niche results in a loss of area. There are less places where the species can establish new population at the top of mountains, and they are harder to find for the species. The second component comes from the life cycle, lifestyle of the plants. Not, they don't, not that they don't exercise enough, but rather because they live long and are not able to replace old plants with newly selected juveniles. This is a problem that also affects forest trees, where old individuals who were selected in the past environment keep producing offspring that are now not adapted to the new local conditions. The problem is the same for those alpine plants, because they can also live for very long, up to 50 years, if not more. But they survive during the winter as small rosettes of leaves under the snow. On top of that, they can also grow vegetatively, like strawberries or aspen, who can grow a new tree from its roots. These plants grow from the roots or stolon as well. This results in a strong competition on the new seedling produced by sexual reproduction. And those seedlings then have difficulty establishing in the population. These are the ones that have passed through the sieve of natural selection. And are, these are the ones that are best adapted to the new local conditions. But because of the lack of turnover of, turnover of the population, that is because of the lack of this renewal of the population, the population is prevented to adapt quickly enough to the new climate conditions. And the population cannot reduce its extinction risks. Of course, this is assuming that species have enough genetic variation to adapt to the new conditions and evolve their ecological niche. We know from many genetic studies that existing species are genetically adapted to their local climate. This is known for many plants, and especially tree species, where we find strong pattern of adaptation to local conditions. However, despite this existence of large genetic variation across the whole range of a species, sometimes across, across a whole continent, it is not guaranteed that the species will be able to adapt to a change in its local climatic conditions. To be able to quickly adapt, the population must be able to quickly assemble the right set of existing genetic mutations necessary to match the new local conditions. This is possible under certain conditions, but not under others. Finding out what are those conditions that will enable a population to adapt genetically to environmental change is a strong focus of my research. We tackle those questions with two main approaches. One is modeling, 
which we mostly do on computers, as, for instance, the modeling of eco-evolutionary responses of alpine plants to climate change. And another approach is experimental, experimental evolution in the lab that we do with an insect model species, the red flower beetle, Trabolium castaneum. This beetle that you see in the background. We were able to evolve experimental population of this beetle to new regimes of temperature and humidity and to study how the expression of their genes changed after many generations in the lab. Our main finding is that, first, the beetles were able to adapt to harsh conditions of high temperature and strong drought, very low humidity. But more importantly, they did so by changing the expression of their genes. The experiment was too small and too short to allow for new mutations to arise in the populations. Therefore, most genetic changes were coming from rearrangement and selection on the exact existing genetic mutations over about 20 generations. We found two main types of responses. First, we found a large number of genes whose expression was plastic. That means that the expression of the genes changed only temporarily, without changing without changes in the DNA sequence of the gene. This type of response is typical to a stress response. It is similar to when we have a, an immune response in our body. In those cases, specific molecular programs are started in our cells to quickly respond to a stress. Certain proteins are then produced en masse to elicit an effect, for instance, wage a war on a virus. Or for heat stress, to protect the cell structure against damage caused by high temperature. These immediate stress responses are usually costly for the individual and cannot be sustained for too long. We know this, for instance, when we suffer from having a strong immune response when we are sick. The long-term response that we observe in our experiment is that the change in expression caused by immediate stress responses usually returns to its pre-stress level after about 20 generations. The second response that we observe is an evolutionary response of the expression of the genes under selection. This time, the genes that show an evolutionary response do not revert their expression level to the pre-stress level, but maintain it at a different level compared to this pre-stress level. And this level corresponds to a different amount of gene products, that is of proteins, that are now produced in the cells of the beetles. And these changes are associated with better performances of the individuals in the new environment. We can thus call this type of response an adaptive response. And we are now looking at the changes in the DNA sequences of those genes to see if we can find specific mutations that become more frequent in our experimental populations after multiple generations of evolution. So, in summary, the research we do in my lab is important to understand what are the species characteristics that help them adapt to new environmental conditions. I have told you about how long-lived species may be specifically sensitive to climate change, although it's certainly not the whole story. We have to do more work to better understand the characteristics that are important for species to adapt to new environmental changes. In my lab, we also develop computational tools that can be used to forecast what we call the eco-evolutionary responses of wild species to environmental changes. And I am looking forward to continue developing those tools in our research program at the University of Helsinki.